Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. John. It's great to have you in worship today. It is July 1st. Can you believe that? It's unbelievable. It certainly feels like July 1st. In fact, it feels like July 1st back in Florida, where I used to live. Um, and uh, so I thank God for air conditioning uh, today. It being July 1st, of course, means that we have a holiday before us on the 4th. And I, and I certainly encourage you to, on that day, just be thankful for this place that we get to call home. We're rife, of course, with so many divisions and um, are too, way too often at each other's throat, but part of that is because I think each and every one of us know that we are inheritors of something precious um, here, and uh, there's much to, therefore, give thanks for. And I hope that you'll do that not only today, uh, but on Wednesday as you eat hamburgers and hot dogs or barbecue or whatever you eat. Um, great holiday. Um, the parish announcement section is in the back of your bulletin. What you'll notice is that we are most definitively on a summer schedule. So a lot of this is save the dates for things that are coming up in the future, and yet there are a couple of things there I would encourage you to look at. One of our uh, Brick for Kids Lego Nights is coming up, and what this is is the Bricks for Kids uh, folks uh, come over to the church, and the kids learn a Bible study. Uh, story, and then they put it together in Lego. So it's a lot of fun. Um, if you want to volunteer and be a part of that, I know Trey Light would love to talk to you about that. But more importantly, we want your kids to be a part. Secondly, our bookstore has a couple of book events that are coming up, and Mary Carter Bishop is going to be with us on July 19th. And then Beth Macy is going to be with us in August, and Beth's book is on the opioid crisis and um, has dealt with some of the, the, the mental health professionals in this church, as I understand it, for this book. So very timely, good stuff. Certainly encourage you to be a part of that. The other thing in the, in the narthex you can get is a little St. John's figurine. Some of you have already gotten this. It's something you can take on vacation. Um, I, I should have gotten them out earlier. Obviously, a lot of our folks are on vacation. Uh, but, uh, but if you haven't gone yet, we would love you to take one of these with you. You can um, send a picture back to the church, and Kira Modisette even has a, a, some instructions on how to do that. Being Kira Modisette, she even tells us how to take the picture, which is, <laughs> which is wonderful, but you can pick up that and the instructions in the, in the narthex and then take it somewhere. It's already been to Westminster Abbey, for instance. I know, happen to know there's one in Jamaica right now. Doesn't that sound good? I've seen it at Smith Mountain Lake. So we post this all over the place, and as everybody's here, there, and yon for the summer, we kind of keep in touch with each other and show how far uh, this congregation of St. John's actually does travel. I'm glad you're here today. Let's worship God.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be your kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Lord be with you. And also Let us pray. Almighty God, you've built your church upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Grant us so to be joined together in unity of spirit by their teaching, that we may be made a holy temple acceptable to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the second book of Samuel. After the death of Saul, when David had returned from defeating the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziglag. David intoned this lamentation over Saul and his son Jonathan. He ordered that the song of the bow be taught to the people of Judah. It is written in the book of Jeshar. He said, your glory, O Israel, lies slain upon your high places. How the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Proclaim it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Or the daughters of the Philistines will rejoice. The daughters of the uncircumcised will exult. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor bounteous fields. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul, anointed with oil, no more. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, the bow of Jonathan did not turn back, nor the sword of Saul return empty. Saul and Jonathan, beloved and lovely, in life and in death, they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles, they were stronger than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you with crimson in luxury, who put ornaments of gold on your apparel. How the mighty have fallen in the midst of the battle. Jonathan lies slain upon your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Greatly beloved were you to me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of war perished. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had suffered from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned to the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you, how can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha, come, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The Gospel of the Lord. A world in need now summons us to labor, love, and give, to make our life an offering to God that all may live. The Church of Christ is calling us to make the dream come true, a world redeemed by Christ-like love, all life in Christ made new. You may be seated. This morning I want to talk to you about divorce. That probably got your attention. But I mean a kind of divorce that 
is different than what almost certainly came to your mind when I said that word. Rather, I want to talk about the divorce that occurs between people and communities. I want to talk about the sort of divorce that occurs between people and their truest selves. The sort of divorce that occurs between people and God. The sorts of divorce that can all but cleave a person in two. Today's gospel starts with Jesus coming home. That's what it means when it says that Jesus crossed again to the other side. What Mark is telling us is that Jesus was coming home across the Sea of Galilee. Now this simple change of location, told in a half sentence, is an easily overlooked detail. Doesn't sound like much. And so generally it's just kind of dismissed as unimportant. And yet I actually believe that that half sentence is crucial to understanding the entire story that Mary just read. I'll go further. That half sentence is crucial to understanding the person and character of Jesus of Nazareth, which should then make every single one of us ask, well, what in the world was happening on the other side of that lake? Glad you asked. Because the answer to that question is amongst the most important things that anyone could ever know about Jesus. What Jesus was doing on the other side of that lake is essential to knowing the nature of Christ. Because where he was on the other side was hanging out on the non-Israel side of that lake. He was on the Gentile side, you know, our side. And he was in a territory known as the Gerasenes. Now, I have been to the Gerasenes. And when I was there, I learned that the word Gerasenes is a word that means the place for the divorced. This was a place that was across the lake and set aside for others. Those who had been exiled or sent away or just cut off. And so over there you encounter the mentally ill and you encounter demoniacs. There's lepers and sinners and the sick, all kinds of outcasts. There's us Gentiles too. You'll meet some pigs and pig swine herds. Yeah, they don't tend to hang out on the Israel side of that lake. And so this was a place for the divorced. The place for those who belong over there, away from us, across that lake. And again, it is my contention that you cannot understand anything about Jesus' life, ministry, the meaning of his death, the implications of his resurrection, if you don't understand that Jesus is the one who goes to the land of the divorced, where people are cut off, thrown out and thrown away, regarded as other. Furthermore, you cannot understand the mission of the church, the body of Christ, which is to be doing God's work, Jesus' work today, because in us Jesus is still here. You can't understand our mission if you don't understand that Jesus is the one who goes to the other side, the divorce side not only of the lake, but of the world. Because any church that actually wants to follow Jesus must also be a church that has a heart for that land of the lost. For the other side is where Jesus is always going. Now over there in the land of the divorced, Jesus heals the Gerasene demoniac. This is an odd story. He comes immediately um, off that boat after he's gone to the Gerasenes, and immediately this young man who's full of demons comes before him. They're named Legion. And he tosses out the demons, and he tosses them into the pigs, and the pigs run down the hill and off the cliff and drown in the Sea of Galilee. And all the pig farmers get really, really mad about this, and they demand that Jesus leave their town. Because these are people who would rather choose ham over humanity. And let me be clear, that's a very common thing to do. The choosing of ham over humanity. 
Well, today Jesus has come back home. He's back to his own people in Israel, and so he's in this land of the connected and the whole, except if you listen well, what Jesus actually encounters back in the land of the connected and the whole is a bunch of people living through all kinds of different ways to also be divorced. They're divorced from being in control. They're divorced from community. They're divorced from life itself. The first one we encounter is a guy named Jairus. Jairus, we're told, is a leader in his synagogue. And so Jairus is a man of ultimate connection. And yet when we meet up with Jairus, he is divorced from being in control. Now, most of us will come to know this sort of divorce at some point in our lives. Where life is going along great until the doctor walks in and you can read the diagnosis all over her face. Life is going along well until the business that you gave 20 years to, you find out some random Wednesday is downsizing. And oh, by the way, the manager wants you in his office in an hour. Everything's going along fine until that late night phone call comes from the police about your son. And boy, was that the last thing that you were expected. Divorce from control. And Jairus, Jairus suffers the worst of this sort of divorce from control possible. He's suffering the, the, the sickness and subsequent death of a child. Suddenly, his former life is over, where he was a bigwig and somebody. Now he's reduced to being nothing but a beggar. And so when Jesus shows up, he falls at Jesus' feet, which is precisely what the young man did on the divorce side of the lake after he was healed. Life brings us all together on the margins. So he falls at Jesus' feet, and he begs for Jesus to come. And Jesus, of course, comes. And yet on the way, a desperate woman grabs a hold of Jesus' garments in a desperate attempt, in desperate faith, to be healed in her life. Hers is the most sad sort of story. She's been hemorrhaging, we've been told, for 12 years. She suffered much under the health care of her day. And what this means is that she has some irregularity in her menstrual cycle. And she's had it for 12 years. Now, that uh, in and of itself would be dreadful and bad enough. And yet the consequences for her are even more extreme. Because Mosaic law is very, very clear that when a woman is menstruating, you have to separate her from community. You ever read the book, The Red Tent? It's all about this. But hers wasn't just a, a brief time once a month. It was 12 years of isolation and separation and exclusion. And she's suffering it alone. In fact, she cannot, by Mosaic law, even be where she is at that moment. That's why she's so fearful when Jesus turns towards her. She's in a crowd full of clean, pure people, and she's not supposed to be amongst them. She cannot, by Mosaic law, grab something holy, like Jesus. And yet she, in desperate faith, grabs him. And what does Jesus do? Does he rebu rebuke her for not knowing her Bible well enough? Does he rebuke her for not knowing her place or exile her back to the place of the divorce where she suffered alone for 12 years? No, he heals. If you listen well, he reflexively heals. He doesn't even know that he's doing it until he does it. And after he does it and he knows why he healed, he rejoices in it and knows it was exactly the right thing to do even though by some stricture of law it was wrong. Jesus reflexively heals. Don't you love that? Now, you've got to understand this healing. 
Jesus doesn't just heal her to make her feel better, although that happens. He doesn't heal her to just get back to some status quo in her mind, which is usually what we want from God when we ask for healing. You know, like, God, help my back so I can get back out on the golf course. He heals her to also restore her to her community. And pay attention here, church, because we have the power to heal people in this way. Heal people. Not in some Benny Hinn televangelist way of healing, but a true sort of healing nonetheless. Restoration to God's people. Inclusion in a community. But that only happens if we care more for humanity than Ham. Well, Jesus continues on his way to the young girl. Remember her? It's what you call a Mark sandwich, by the way. The girl, we learn, is 12. So unlike the woman who has been losing her life for 12 years, this young girl has lost her life after 12 years. And so Jesus crosses over into this last sort of divorce possible, the ultimate divorce that will happen to each and every one of us here, divorce from life itself. And when he crosses over into that far territory, what does he do? He does what he always does. He restores life. Now, it's important to, to realize that Jesus has once again broken a Mosaic law. Just like you can't touch a woman who's menstruating, you can't touch a dead body and remain ritually pure. But Jesus, it turns out, cares more about humanity than Ham. And so Jesus grabs a hold of this young girl, and the girl is restored. And what I love is by the end, Jairus, this great leader in the synagogue, well, he could care less that a rule got broken. All he cares about is that his daughter was restored, because when it came to his own daughter, humanity mattered more than Ham. It always does when it comes to our sons and daughters. What we need to realize is it must be that way when it comes to other people's sons and daughters. So let them with ears hear. By the end, everybody's restored. Well, except for maybe the crowd. I I don't know if you noticed, but they thought all this was really funny for some reason. I guess it's viewed as comical in a world such as ours to have someone suggest that death won't have the last word. I guess it's kind of a hoot to suggest that somehow outcasts could ever be brought in from their exile. I guess it sounds like a joke in this world that someone would expose himself to the dirtiness of others when he has been given every excuse not to have to do so. But you want to know what's more funny in this world? God gets the last laugh. And that is truly gut-busting, side-splittingly funny. It's wonderfully, delightfully funny that Jesus loves you and me more than any rules. It's called grace. Grace. And it's in such dreadfully short supply in this world, that when we encounter it, it seems silly and comical and absurd, which it actually is. It is wonderfully silly, delightfully comical, and truly absurd that Jesus would deign to cross over and become so intimate in this world, but never has become of it. I don't know in what emotional or physical shape you have come in here today. Maybe you've been isolated or even cut off in some way in in your life from family, from friends, maybe, maybe even from society itself. 
from the health that you've always just kind of taken for granted. Or maybe it's just as simple as a loss of a sense of control over your own life. But however it is that you have come in here today, may I suggest that Jesus' words to that little girl are for you as well. To her, he said, Talitha kum, little girl, get up. And no matter who you are or what you're going through or what you have done, today he's saying to you, get up, I'm here. I've crossed to the other side for you. To any who have been cast aside or cast out or or tossed down, get up. It's time to come home. To those who think that life is about winners and losers and insiders and outsiders and, and somehow that gives us license to mistreat or discount other people, he's saying to you, you better get up. You better go to the other side. Quit all that laughing or I will show you who's really going to get the last laugh around here. To this body here gathered, he's saying, church, get up. Be my body, welcoming home every last outcast. To every single person here today, to lead the coom, get up. Jesus has crossed back over from the land of the divorced. In fact, there's no land of the divorced anymore unless we just make it so. For once Jesus went to the Gerasenes, the Gerasenes are no more unless we make it so. But he's now on the other side from all that. For a place of the divorce could never be his home. If that's where others want to make their home, good luck to them. The demons over there are legion. And over there, they're always making the mistake of choosing ham over humanity. But let us go with him to the other side from all that and make our home in the great mansion of his grace, forever living, for Jesus has made his home for all. People of God, Talitha Kum. Amen. Together we respond by reciting the words of our faith in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the
In peace we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those of our world. for this community, the nation, and the world, for all who work for justice, freedom, and peace, for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God and the church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, especially for those named on our parish prayer list. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We praise your name forever. We pray for all who have died, especially Sarah Ann Light, for those whom we remember on the anniversary of their deaths as named on our parish prayer list, for those who have died this week in service to their country, and for those who have perished in war-torn areas of the world, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people and the multitude of your mercy. Look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, a lover of souls, and to you we give glory. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Again, let me welcome you to St. John's this morning. As we come to the time of Eucharist and this communion table, it is a wonderful representation of that unity that Christ asks us to seek out in our day-to-day -day lives and in our communities. And we do it here first, and then it, it kind of carries out from this place. If you are a brother and sister in Christ to us and you are a visitor, you're welcome to come and share in the communion meal with us. If you'd like to come forward and receive a blessing but not take communion, simply cross your arms across your chest and one of the priests will bestow God's blessing upon you. I walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering, sacrifice to God.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death in the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. And we celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, with him, and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. These holy mysteries. We are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.